Welcome to The Culture Bar, a panel discussion podcast exploring, dissecting and shedding light on important topics in the arts and music world which matter to you. Hello, I'm Fiona Livingston and in this After Hours Fireside Chat we will be talking to Sarah Kirkham, Museum Officer at Enfield Museum in London, marking International Museum Day. Welcome Sarah. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Thank you for being here. Um, this year's Museum Day theme is the future of museums, recover and reimagine. So during our conversation with Sarah, we will be finding out more about working in a museum and with collections, but specifically talking about how COVID-19 has impacted museums, addressing if how we think and treat collections has changed as a result, what changes have been made to help recovery, and what does the future look like? So Sarah, um, I think it will be really interesting to start our conversation by telling our listeners a bit about your museum journey, where you've worked and how you've gained your collections experience. Absolutely. So like a lot of uh, museum um, employees and workers uh, started off by volunteering. So it was in my later half of the second year uh, uni. Um, yes, yeah, started off volunteering at a local museum in Lancaster. Um, which was absolutely fascinating. That then led to um, a deeper understanding and a passion for museum behind the scenes work. So everything that kind of goes on behind the scenes and how to get a collection out there to the public, how do you develop an exhibition, how do you do collections management, just all um, just sounded so completely interesting. Um, so after I started volunteering, that then um, moved me to getting hold of the Lancashire County Museum Service based in Preston um, and I volunteered with them for about four years. Um, whilst I was there I did everything from cataloguing, exhibitions, um, a little bit of conservation, you name it I did it there. Um, whilst I was there I was also told that you had to have a master's degree in order to get a job in a museum. Now at the I don't completely agree with that at all. <laughs> it's just one route to go down. But at the time I was told you have to get this in order to get an entry level position. So I thought, okay, I'll go down that route. Um, so I did my master's in museum studies from the University of Leicester, distance learning, which was fantastic. I highly recommend distance learning because you could just learn your pajamas. Perfect. Um, so I did that for about two years. And then that led me to get my first entry level job at the Modern Lawn Tennis Museum is based at the All England Club, obviously in Wimbledon, um, as the cataloging assistant. Um, and my main role there was to try and go through the backlog. Every museum has a backlog. <laughs> um, I don't think there's a museum out there that has a perfect collection. There is always some form of backlog. Um, so while I was there, I just had to go through the, the backlog. Um, also got involved in exhibition work and for the first time as well, getting involved in events and trying to get the collection out there and make it accessible to the public in different ways. At the time, it was through social media, doing Facebook Live events, um, trying to find new ways to connect the public with the collection. Um, I was there for about, oh gosh, just shy of four years. Um, and then after that, I went to the National Portrait Gallery where I was helping out to um, manage the database there, training people on how to use a database, um, doing, uh, looking at data inconsistencies, um, making sure that quality control was up to, up to date and that everything ran to Spectrum standards. Now, Spectrum is the collections management um, term for how you can kind of, um, catalog a collection, the basic steps that you need and principles about it as well, so object entry and exit. Um, I was at the industrial portrait gallery for about a year. Um, and by the time I was leaving, it's sometimes it is kind of um, common in the museum sector as well. There weren't that many collections jobs available based in London, which means that I, I didn't have a job to go to. So for that, I then went to do a personal assistant role for seven months um, at another organization. At the time I thought, this is terrible, I'm out of the museum sector, I don't have a connection. But then I thought, hold on, change it a little bit, get your um, perspective um, up to date. And um, I then decided just to enhance my admin skills, get my organiz organization skills up to date, um, taking minutes in meetings, 
dealing with trustees and board members and trying to kind of collect that information and that experience that I didn't have the opportunity to do before, which was fantastic. Um, so after I was there for about, yeah, seven months, um, and then I got a job at the Science Museum, hey. um, working on their Mass Collections Move project based at Blythe House, which is a wonderful building in West Kensington. Um, it houses the Science Museum collection, the b &A collection, and the British Museum collection. So the project for the Science Museum and the Wonder on Collection um, title was to move over 300,000 objects from Blythe House to the National Collection Centre in Wiltshire, um, in Broughton. So the Science Museum are building, or have built by now actually, a huge hangar to house their amazing collection from across their complete sites. Um, so my role for that, uh, for that museum was to be part of the hazard team. Bit of a jump from doing collections management database to then going to hazards, <laughs> but it was an interesting step and one that I think helped kind of incorporate all my collections knowledge into one part and then help me get this current role as well. Um, but whilst I was there, I, my role was to assess objects for hazardous materials. So anything from asbestos, mercury, lead, historic chemicals, um, materia medica, which is basically anything from medicinal products. Um, it was fascinating. There's some interesting stuff in the collection. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, I did that role for about just shy of a year, and then I was promoted to manage the hazard team, to get a bit of management experience, which was brilliant. Um, I did that for about a year and a bit. And then in January this year, I then started my current role, which is Museum Officer at Enfield Museum. Amazing. Oh, thank you for that, Sarah. I love how you managed to um, change your jobs during a pandemic as well. Uh, <laughs> it's very impressive. Not, yeah, a completely new experience. <laughs> I can only but imagine, but I, I really love how you explained your experiences because it really shows how all of your experience, whether it was in a museum or working as a PA, like really helped to kind of mold your experiences and sort of fill those gaps yes. um, that you Absolutely. may have missed from other bits of experiences. So I think it's really important that, you know, people who are maybe looking for a career in museums and collections or, you know, anywhere really in the arts and culture sector, that, you know, all your experience is useful and applicable applicable um absolutely how you you know how you talk about those things and how you can apply them in, in your role so I think that's like a really really great example with your career of how varied it is as well like all the different yeah. places you've worked all the different types of roles that you've had that have led to you becoming museum officer in your current role so no, it's really really fascinating so thank you for sharing um sharing that with us <laughs> it's all about transferable skills as well yeah. so you don't so just for getting the basic admin skills, you don't have to get that in a museum setting. Yeah, It can exactly. be in a different setting. Um, and even, say, research skills, if you needed that to get into a particular role. University. Exactly. You've had to do research as part of that. <laughs> exactly it's all dissertation. Skills. exactly <laughs> exactly Every, everything is applicable so you know that was mm. a really really great example to kind of see how that all fits in and very inspiring too Sarah so thank you um and now to kind of jump into our, our hot topic of sort of recovery and reimagining museums uh for International Museum Day um it would be really great if you could talk to us a bit about how you've seen the impact of well, COVID-19, um, how that's impacted museums and the collections that, you know, maybe you worked with, um, just to kind of give our listeners a bit of a sense of scope, like as to the impact that COVID had on museums and uh, collections, which they might not be aware of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think the, the museums completely miss public interaction. So as soon as the pandemic hit and lockdown hit, Museums have obviously had to close. And they, can you imagine, museums are normally a hive of activity. There's normally events going on. If we're engaging the public, um, you know, it's a place where people can go and meet with friends and family and just have a, a nice space to actually just reflect and enjoy the collections on a one-to-one -one basis. And that was completely gone when the pandemic started. Um, particularly for, for me, um, working at the Science Museum at that time, it was on a time-sensitive project and a very much a store-based project. 
So then having to kind of do that and then reevaluate how we then do a role from home was a completely new experience for me. <laughs> and, and how did you do that? Oh, well, I had about seven hours to rethink mine and my team's role of how can we do this store-based role from home at the same time of making sure the project carries on and the team feel comfortable and safe enough to do that at home. Um, so making sure that their health and well-being was at the top of my agenda. So what I eventually did was come up with this system where we would hazard assess and review objects in the store on the last day, make as many notes as possible through different objects, through locations, through the condition, and um, put all that onto paper, and then think of things that could be done remotely. Whereas that's kind of updating the database, if it's doing a desktop assessment of an upcoming location, if it's trying to learn more about a particular hazardous material, then that could be done from home. Um, so I basically help the team out by going through as many locations as possible. Um, so they had a really good chunk of work to do. Because at that time, we obviously didn't know how long the pandemic was going to last. Were we just going to be working from home for a couple of weeks? Is it a month? Is it just a week? We had no idea. Um, so, so yes, I sort of collated all that information and came up with a schedule, my wonderful spreadsheet schedule, where I signed each member of my team a particular task and kind of emphasized the fact that like, it's not going to be like you're going to be on site and working together in the normal way. Take your time doing so. Completely pace yourself. There isn't a time limit to carry out these tasks if at any point you then feel this is a bit too much just stop and have a bit of a respite if you need to take the rest of the day as a mental health day do it absolutely time because we were slowly running out of things to do and we were getting to the point where we would need to go back to the store in order to actually get some more information and get some more things to do from home so that came at a good point and yeah. um, then I was we were furloughed until July when everything was sort of easing off a little bit and we were able to actually then go in on site for any business critical work okay so for that um, I then decided to change the way we worked on site as well so oh. I incorporated a lot of work from home days to make sure that we sort of had that balance so if they didn't feel comfortable going on site I mean I didn't feel as comfortable, particularly for public transport, um, then change the hours that we work. Come in a little bit later, or if you wanted to start earlier, then absolutely fine. Um, and I've sort of kind of like changed that completely, which then set the tone for the rest of the year mm -hmm. for how they then worked throughout the additional two, three lockdowns that we've had. <laughs> that sort of set the tone for everything. And it made them feel more comfortable and yeah able to actually carry out their job there yeah but it also highlighted that not everything we did had to be done on site yeah so to me it sort of made me rethink collection management in total wow. so things that we don't actually have to do on site we can do it from home so trying to incorporate that flexible working anything database related doesn't technically have to be doing stuff I mean it's great if you do have the object with you and there are some don't get me wrong, there are some jobs that you do actually have to have the objects in front of you in order to, to carry out your role, um, but it's not necessary. Yeah. So it's trying to add that flexible element to it. Yeah, that's really well. interesting. Like, I think it's really interesting to get this kind of um, perspective from a kind of behind the scenes aspect of museums because you know when when uh, you know um, visitors come and visit the museum it's it's all the front side you know it's the yeah. experience it's all the interactions like I don't think a lot of people really think about what goes on in the sort of storeroom collection kind of area um, and you know maybe a lot of people thought that um, you know uh, during COVID-19 and when everything was closed that you know everything just sat on the shelves and you know there wasn't really a problem you know maybe somebody came in every so often and dusted them a bit you know um but it's really interesting to kind of see that actually you know there are lots of projects taking place even Absolutely. you know in the collections in the storerooms that you know are preserving these objects for the future as well as you know assessing them and, and moving them to better locations um and that these things don't just stop 
no you know, and that's all I mean and that you've had to you know like you said you've had to completely rethink how your team works mm. um, and maybe actually some of these changes like you said um, are maybe long-term changes as well like will flexible working for you know um, collection staff be a way of the future you know you you come in when you need to be there for the objects you come in for a certain number of days a week and then you go back and do all your database stuff at home so you know maybe that opens up kind of collections management experience to different people as well you know maybe people who've got families who can't come in five days a week maybe now it's maybe opening that kind of those doors a bit wider to encourage more and different people to be able to work in um collections which can be a you know a really positive thing that's that that's oh, absolutely so um, yeah and I mean I even, <laughs> yeah I, I actually think that um remote working has completely changed the way that I think about about work anyway so particularly if you wanted to do some volunteering in a museum for instance again th- that can be done remotely if we have a look if we look at it critically then you know, if you wanted to update something on the database or create a blog about something, then or try and transcribe something, then we could send a, a digital copy to the volunteer, and they could do that remotely. So they still have that connection of volunteering for the museum. Yes, it's not going to be the same as actually being on site, but they can still be able to have that connection and mm-hmm. still be able to feel like they've got a contribution to the museum and do actually feel yeah. involved. Yeah, so it's absolutely. completely changed. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I think it's actually like really exciting. And um, I was going to ask as well, like, do you think that, you know, during COVID-19 and the changes that you had to make to how you manage the, 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 the collections that you were in charge of, like, do you think it's sort of highlighted how collections are kind of viewed and, and cared for by museums? And, you know, were there any gaps or that, that you've noticed? Or do you, do you think maybe in a way the collections were taken for granted? Ah, good question. Um, I definitely think that we've started to view collections and how we can get them out digitally. So the digital impact has just completely blown and it's absolutely amazing. Um, So we've been, you know, there's loads of innovation going around digital at the moment. So for the Science Museum, for instance, doing their online collection and trying to make that little aspect of viewing something that hasn't really been viewed before. Um, I don't know if you've, if you've seen that um, application, but it's fantastic. So do you think there's lots more scope for um, digital to play a much stronger role, not just in maybe the collections management side of things, but in how visitors can actually interact with the museum? Because, you know, a lot of yeah. people are, are tourists to museums, especially to the museums in, in London. You know, they, they, they travel all across the world to view um, the collections so I mean obviously a digital experience doesn't replace the in real life experience but maybe it actually opens up you know those collections and those experiences to people who may not otherwise be able to travel to London or to you know catch um, a train or a plane or a boat or get in a car (laughs) to be able to to travel to the museum so um, have you seen any it'd be really interesting to know like if you've seen any sort of uh, really interesting, you know, kind of innovations that museums, n- not necessarily the ones that you've worked in, but some that you've seen that you've maybe been inspired by or admired for, you know, maybe how they are, you know, dealing with, you know, making their collections more accessible, but also, you know, how they're rethinking the museum experience as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, looking at smaller museums, for instance, the Museum of Richmond recently put on a virtual exhibition about the King's Observatory, which was fantastic. And it's still available on their Twitter feed. Um, And then there's, you know, the Brunel Museum has recently started a virtual escape room, which I think is brilliant. And that's definitely something that I'm going to try and steal. That's incredible. I know. (laughs) Um, I'm definitely going to try and do something like that for Enfield, I think, in the future. Um, But I think a lot of museums as well have also started to utilise different social media platforms and how to engage the public with the collection through those platforms. One massive example would be the Black Country Museum utilising TikTok. (laughs) Really? Which was fantastic. Um, it's still available to actually um, see as well. There's loads of news articles about it. Um, but they obviously got people involved through their engagement progress um, with the collection and with the museum and the work the museum did as well. Um, and there's been loads of other, other things. Like loads of museums as well have started to look at 
their education resources. Mm. So how can they put on an educational activity that you would normally have people coming into the museum to do, but doing it online? Mm -hmm. So um, quite a few museums have started doing, uh, I think Greenwich as well actually, has um, done a couple of educational programs online um Enfield for instance we have um school loan boxes I know it's not digital but it's another aspect that we've tried to do where schools would then loan a particular box of handling collections and then use that in their online teaching mm -hmm. as well as trying to use it obviously in the classroom but then using it for online resources as well um which I think is fantastic yeah, it's really amazing like it, it's I feel like it's opened up so many more like opportunities for museums and collections to be creative it's like broken mm. away those kind of barriers that people might have had to introducing digital um to their collections or to their museum experiences because you know you know in the past particularly with things like art galleries you know having you know too much tech and too much interactive um you know facilities in the museum or the art gallery was seen as like this negative thing you know it was like you know tech yeah. you know the busyness of technology was encroaching you know on the peace and the tranquility of the of the museum or, or the art gallery and having that human connection with with an object or with a piece of art and and I just feel like COVID has just completely blown that out of the water and people mm -hmm. have now realized you know that actually they have to find you know digital means or even you know in real life experiences that fit for their museum that fit for their yep. collection you know not everything will fit for everyone it's not a blanket approach but finding things that really are useful for get you know spreading the word for their collection for their, yeah. for their museum for their you know the exhibitions they've got on for education like you said and like really embracing these changes and technology um and I just think it's a really it's I for me it really it's exciting listening to you talking about these things because it's just it feels like it's just opened up all of these opportunities for museums to really reach new audiences as well, yeah. who they may not have reached before. Absolutely. I think it also brings in the fact that it makes everything a bit more accessible. So particularly now, some people probably, they might not want to go and visit the site. They might have anxiety about going onto public transport um, or being in spaces again. So this digital aspect would then give them the opportunity to visit um, and I think it's also important to note as well that because obviously numbers are diminishing in terms of public going on site, I mean, now that we're going to have a drop in numbers for overseas visitors as well, who made up a huge proportion of museum vis visitors as well, um, you know, bringing that digital element to it, I think kind of means that the museum can connect more. Yeah. Um, and also going on to um, people visiting the digital attractions and um, digital aspects that also means that counts as a football as well so people the museum is kind of connecting with people and is technically getting a visitor even if it is a digital visitor that's still a visitor yeah so it kind of gets the museum out there as well and make and make sure people kind of know look we're still here we're still doing things um Absolutely. as well which is which is great yeah yeah I love that example of you know actually using you know and thinking about website visitors as footfall because I think yeah. that's something for a long time that museums didn't really think about they were just like oh we've had this amount of website visitors oh that's really great but what does that actually mean and now it actually has I mean it always had meaning but now it really mm. has weight and it Absolutely. Yeah, because it means that people are still visiting the museum. They're just doing it in a different way. Um, so I think going forward, I think it's going to be a more of a blended approach to that as well. Mm -hmm. So incorporating the digital site visit as well as the on-site visit. So not just depending on people coming to visit you, which would be great anyway. And it's definitely something that should be encouraged, but also looking at the digital aspect of that and going, OK, well, people are still visiting. They're still engaging with us. It's just in a different way. Yeah, and it's something absolutely. that museums have completely embraced. And I think it's something that's going to be growing as we go through this pandemic and get out of it. And it's definitely something that's going to come in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that leads nicely on to my next question for you is, um, you know, have you seen any um, positive changes um, for the sort of recovery aspect of museums coming out of COVID? You know, um, 
you know, are, are there any, you know, like, like we've talked about, are there any things that kind of happened, you know, with the collections or with museums during the kind of shutdowns and the lockdowns and everything that um, have actually made future changes? You know, these are now going to be things that we are going to set in stone for things that we move forward. Have, have there been any examples that you've seen of where um, there might be that kind of new change that is now going to become part of the future of museums and uh, collections? Um, yeah, I think uh, there was a an initiative going around the first lockdown, which was Museums from Home. Oh, interesting. Um, which um, was run by um, Dan Vo, and um, that was, I mean, that kind of got loads of museums involved in different sizes, who would then sort of tr do their own sort of museum esque experience, but obviously from home. So um, I did see that the Tennessee Museum at Wimbledon did uh, lectures about Wimbledon's history at home. Um, Sasha Cohen, for instance, Cowage Functions, um, also did things about particular topics. Um, I think he used to work for the Royal Museum's Greenwich. So he did things about folklore and mermaids and LGBT, uh, LGBTQ. Um, topics as well all from this hashtag museum from home so um i think we're going to be seeing more initiatives like that and then also more working collaboratively with other museums through mm. digital aspects so yeah um definitely and that's i think what, yeah that's really interesting actually i was going to say like that just I mean, museums have always kind of had partnerships with, with, with other people, you know, and, and, you know, with other organisations, you know, whether it's like about a specific exhibition or you like a specific object or something like that. But I really I agree with you. I think now that, you know, because of something like Museums from Home, that was such a massive collaborative effort to get yeah. everyone and bringing them together under one umbrella. No one was competing with each other. Everybody no. had the same goal of trying to get museums into people's home to kind of spread knowledge education, learning, you know, the, bringing the excitement of the museum and collections into people's homes. Like, I think, I, I agree, I think that it will be just amazing to see more of that in the future of, you know, seeing museums and, you know, and, and other organisations in the arts and culture world, because they've all been impacted by, by COVID-19 very severely. Mm working together you know like yep. let, let's get rid of this competitiveness you know we're all here with the same message with, with you yep. know same drive you know let's support each other let's do more of these initiatives to you know try and build something for the future you know and and let's utilize like each, each other's connections knowledge and everything to yeah. really build something super exciting and I love that mu uh, that museums at home example it's such a simple thing to have done mm. as well absolutely um there's actually a recent example of a similar thing which is called um, My Local Museum oh. and it was started by a group of museums in Cumbria where they would highlight different um, topics and objects in their collection so um, the recent theme for the this week I think it is is about hats and hair and it's highlighting things in the collection that have something to do with hats or something to do with hair oh lovely um and loads of museums have picked up on this and it's now spread from outside of cumbria across the uk really there's museums in london doing it um <laughs> there's a different theme each week and it's, it's just viral. highlighting <laughs> it has gone viral and it's just highlighting the local museum as well so absolutely moving away from the national it's looking at museum the smaller museums and the regional museums that you have it's looking at their collections and trying to engage with the local community, which is something I think is going to be something that museums will have to do going forward, yeah. is, is to connect with the local community more and to create yeah. those partnerships, like you say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Working with different teams. Um, if you have noticed that another museum, a local museum or a local organisation has done something, then, and you think, okay, I could do that go and talk to them and pick up yeah. on that and try and see if there's a way that you could work together to make a collaboration event about it as well. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's a really, really important point that you just raised there that, you know, this isn't just about the national museums. This is no. actually a really important 
moment now for local museums, regional museums to grab their chance to really spread the word about their collections and the amazing work that they all do for the yeah. for their local communities. And and as you said before, like, you know, we're not going to have as many tourists coming and visit us. So we need to be able to fulfill the needs of local communities Absolutely. and to be able to engage with them and speak with them. So I think that's a really important almost like long-term impact mm. in a way of COVID. Yeah. That, you know, it's not just about this international aspect of, you know, getting tourists in. It's really about nurturing your home audience mm. and you yeah, know, engaging absolutely. them. As well as, like you said, building those partnerships and those um, collaborations for the future. Do you think, mm. that, just out of interest, do you think there'll be maybe more funding of projects and exhibitions and um collaborative you know kind of um goings on you know through you know maybe may maybe big sponsors and things like that you know to try and maybe um you know capitalize on these local communities and and you know with bringing all of these different um connections in with all of these different mm. museums do you think that that's maybe something that might happen in the future or or not there's a possibility i mean i don't think you can rule anything out at, at this stage um i do think for organizations like Arts Council and Heritage Lottery Fund there are going to be more applications mm. for funding and for projects so I think it's going to get more competitive mm. but I don't think it's something to rule out that there might be a local organization that wants to to fund an exhibition or to fund say conservation of an object at a local museum that might link to their that organization's heritage um, I don't think it's something that we should rule out and it could be a possibility and yeah. um, that's definitely something that I think I'd like to try and explore going forward for my museum. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think um, like we've highlighted during this this conversation, like there's just so many opportunities now that are open to us to yeah. try and spread the word about museums and, and uh, collections, you know, which just weren't really considered before, because I think, you know, maybe the objectives or the goals of the museum or, or, or for that uh, collection were different. You yeah. know, and now those goals have completely changed um, because of COVID-19 and everybody's had to reassess hmm. who their audience is. What are they here for? How are they going to communicate with these audiences? And, and I think the examples that you've given have really highlighted like all the different ways that museums are now thinking about this. I mean, it's still early days, of course, you know, we're only oh, just, yeah. I mean, in the UK, we're only just coming out of our, you know, <laughs> supposed lockdown part three. Um, but, you know, it's, and it's really an exciting time to, for museums to completely reimagine what their future is going to look like. You know, they are not just four brick walls anymore, you know, yeah. It really is this whole hemisphere that they are now able to connect with, you know, like we said, communities, digital partnerships, other museums yep. and collections to be able to really spread the word and, and kind of generate some momentum with that. Um, and I just really mm. wanted to kind of end our note on a, on a great, a great positive from, from you as, um, you know, what do you, you know, considering everything that, that we've talked about, what do you sort of see as the, the reimagining of museums and collections, you know, what do you see as the, the way forwards um, for the future? I think trying to get the collection out there as much as possible. So something that I am hoping to do for, for Enfield is to take the collection to the public. So currently the museum building, which is housed in the Dugdale Centre, is being used as a vaccination centre, which is absolutely fantastic. There are always queues outside, which is great. Um, but the vaccination centre will be obviously needed until potentially early autumn or later in the year at some point. So I need to think about how I can get the public access to the collection and to the museum and what the museum has to offer without physically coming into the museum anymore. So I'm looking at trying to get the collection, the museum out to the public across the borough. So I'm also going to be utilising libraries, working collaboratively with libraries, looking at spaces to display objects in there, holding potential events potentially either with a library or just using the library spaces for it. Maybe looking at outdoor exhibitions where potentially they don't have objects associated with it, but there are panels and interpretation out there in the public, either in parks or on high streets, that still kind of have that museum element to it. And it just reminds people that here's the museum, it is here, it is doing something. So I think that's quite important as well, to try and take the museum 
out of the museum, if that makes sense. So take the collection <laughs> out of there um, and try and think about how we can get the public involved and engage with them in new ways. It doesn't, like you say, it doesn't have to be four walls. It can, so you, you can have a digital exhibition, for instance. You can have panels out in the public. You can go and work and do an event in a park or, you know, in a park space or a green space. Um, which then obviously means that social distancing will be able to will comply with that because that's going to be something that is going to be around for a while, I think. Um, so then that kind of helps and gets the public out there as well. Mm-hmm. So there's loads of ways. Um, and yeah. definitely the library aspect is something that I'm going to be looking yeah. at and digital. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm looking at how I can work with different organisations and different teams within the museum yeah. and the council that I'm currently connected with. So. Yeah. No, that all sounds like extremely exciting and I'll definitely be at your next outdoor event. (laughs) Absolutely. I'll send you the link. (laughs) Thank you. Um, But no, that's amazing. Um, Thank you so much for sharing your insights and thoughts with us, um, Sarah, um, especially on this special International Museum Day. Um, And it's, you know, it's really great to kind of, you know, be like a phoenix coming out of the flames with the <laughs> museums and collections you know reimagining and you know lo- looking at the recovery and you know it's really great to see that you know museums and collections are here to stay um, they are solid and you know yep. they're, they're just going to be reimagined in totally new and different ways to reach as many people as possible and yeah that's all that matters at the end of the day isn't it absolutely it's going to be they're going to be more accessible than ever coming to you in like you say a variety of ways in different aspects absolutely thank you very much sarah thank you thank you sarah for being with us today to discuss museums and collections in our after hours chat series which discusses issues relating more broadly to the arts and culture sector thank you also to merlin thomas our editor and robert cochran composer of our theme tune music We hope you enjoyed this podcast, and if you haven't done so already, be sure to check out all the other episodes from The Culture Bar, with topics ranging from asking, can art and digital mix, to awareness and representation in the arts. We've had guests from the Whitechapel Gallery, BBC and the British Museum, former pro football referees, to members of the UK Parliament and practising musicians and artists. And to get all of that and more, please subscribe or leave us a review.